Well, hello everyone and welcome to this lecture on type 2 diabetes and public health correlates and prevention. So today we're going to be talking about some basic principles in type 2 diabetes and specifically how they relate to public health and how we can take some of those principles and target it towards prevention in both public health as well as uh, primary health care settings. So my name is Brian Mangum, and I'm a consultant epidemiologist, and I'm also an assistant professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at Fiji National University. And I'm also an assistant professor of public health at the College of Micronesia FSM in Pompeii, where I'm currently based for the uh, next three years, working with the public health training program, as well as the Pacific Island Health Officers Association on a number of different initiatives. And uh, you can see a little bit about me there. Most of you know who I am already and uh, know about my background. But those who don't, feel free to uh, take a look there. So let's just jump in and start talking about what is diabetes right off the get-go here. Well, most of you already know that there's essentially two different types of diabetes. We've got the type 1 diabetes and we've got the type 2 diabetes. Now, as you already know, type 1 diabetes is simply a disease in which the body fails to produce any insulin, and it's primarily hereditary. And because it's hereditary, it's largely not uh, preventable. Okay. But it's really only a very small percentage of our cases of diabetes. So you can see there it only represents about 5% of all cases of diabetes. And of course it requires lifetime maintenance with insulin. And we generally diagnose this in early childhood or early in the teenage years. Now while type 1 diabetes is important from a public health standpoint, it's not going to be the emphasis of this lecture. And it's actually not the emphasis of the majority of our public health efforts that we have out there involved diabetes is one of the major non-communicable diseases that we're dealing with in the world and in particular here in the Pacific where we have the highest um, the highest burden of uh, diabetes in the world and that highest burden of course is focused on type 2 diabetes. So let's go ahead and let's talk about type 2 diabetes and that's going to be the major emphasis of this lecture and like I would mentioned already as you understand already it's the major public health concern that we have throughout the world. Now in difference to type 1 diabetes here we see that the body actually produces insulin but it's unable to adequately trigger the conversion of food into energy. Okay, Whereas type 1 diabetes is largely going to be hereditary type 2 diabetes is primarily going Going to be lifestyle linked. Now, there are some hereditary predispositions with type 2 diabetes. So if you have a close family member that has two, type 2 diabetes or if you have a uh, history of type 2 diabetes in your family, then genetics actually does play a role here. Okay, But largely that genetics is uh, surmounted by lifestyle issues. So even if you do have a genetic predisposition to type 2 diabetes, that genetic predisposition can actually be overcome by living a moderately healthy lifestyle. Okay. Whereas if you have a genetic predisposition to uh, type 2 diabetes, but you choose not to live a healthy lifestyle, uh, you consume the wrong foods, you are largely sedentary, you smoke, so on and so forth, um, then that's going to introduce in the pathology of type 2 diabetes. So in other words, in the vast majority of cases of type 2 diabetes, it's, it's preventable. It's preventable by making appropriate lifestyle decisions. Now in the populations that you and I serve here in the uh, Pacific, we know that lifestyle choices are not always easy choices for people to make because of a, a variety of economic as well as sociocultural indicators that they sometimes have to overcome. And I actually do have a lecture that deals with um, global economic and nutritional shifting uh, as the roots of this global NCD pandemic. And we go much further into why sometimes the choices that people have are not necessarily going to be uh, good options for them because they're finding that their economic and their uh, lifestyle choices are going to be moderated by the jobs that they have and those jobs that they have which make it difficult to afford a diet rich in fruits and vegetables are oftentimes moderated by large-scale economic and social indicators. So please go out on my YouTube channel and you can find that lecture on global economic and nutritional shifting that goes uh, much further into this. Okay. Now, like we mentioned already, type 2 diabetes is actually going to represent about 95% of all cases of diabetes. So that means that 95% 
you know, if we were to take a large scale view here, what that means is that 95% of the cases of diabetes that we have out there that are associated with so much of the money and the economic and the human resources that we put into prevention and uh, a, a treatment here in the Pacific actually could be prevented. In fact, you probably remember for a lot of you that have been in the uh, in nursing and medicine and public health for a long period of time, you remember we used to call this adult onset diabetes. Well, we don't call it adult onset diabetes because we're seeing that is becoming increasingly a younger and a younger population that we're seeing with type 2 diabetes. Now the thing with type 2 diabetes to help populations understand is that uh, just like type 1 diabetes you can't be cured of it and so it's going to require lifetime maintenance of medications if medications are a requirement as, uh, as well as lifestyle modifications to avoid the complications of diabetes. Okay, so both type 1 and type 2 diabetes are associated with this idea of insulin. Now, if you remember, insulin is simply a hormone. It's produced by the pancreas, which is located there in the abdomen. You can see a, a picture of that off to the side there, so right below the liver and the stomach, okay? And insulin is going to be released into the bloodstream to help convert the sugars or the glucose in the foods that we convert. Uh, it's going to help convert it into energy because it's going to be the mechanism whereby this is going to be transported into the cells of the body where uh, that cellular level metabolism is going to occur. Okay, And that's going to be cellular level metabolism uh, in all of the organs of the body, whether it be the brain, whether it be the heart, the lungs, the liver, so on and so forth. We need the insulin to take the food that we eat and convert it over into uh, energy so that we can metabolize at the uh, level of the cell and we can continue to function both as uh, individual organ systems across the body as well as a whole individual. So we need insulin, okay? The problem is going to become with type 2 diabetes is um, can we take the insulin that we have and can we turn it into energy at the cellular level? And that's where the problems come in in terms of the, the uh, diet choices that we make that are going to make it difficult for us to uh, convert the insulin into energy. Energy, all right, and as you already know, there's a couple of different stages uh, in our pre-diabetics, and one of them is insulin resistance, where we have individuals that maybe are not full-blown type 2 diabetics, but they're already reaching the point where they're not adequately able to use the insulin that their body is producing to uh, convert sugar into energy at the cellular level. So we have this concept of hyperglycemia, all right? So in other words, if we're producing um, insulin but we're not able to use it, then we become or hyperglycemic. So in other words, we have an excess of glucose that is present in the bloodstream. And the thing about the excess glucose that's present in the bloodstream is it's, um, it's unable to enter the cells because of our resistance to the insulin, all right? And so the glucose levels are actually going to build up in the body and uh, build up in the blood, and that's going to cause hyperglycemia. Glycemia. And if you remember your medical terminology, remember hyper simply means an increase of something. So hyperglycemia simply means an increase of the glucose. Um, hypertension would be increased uh, blood pressure. Okay. Now the thing is that the longer the blood glucose levels are high and the higher the glucose levels remain, then the more rapidly we're going to get complications from diabetes develop. Okay. Now, this is particularly important in our patients, obviously, who are already diabetics. And from a public health and a clinical standpoint, it's going to be very important at, that we develop systems whereby we not only educate the population of individuals that we have under our care who are diabetics, but we also uh, we educate them so that they understand the signs and the symptoms of blood glucose buildup in their systems, okay? And also that we find ways that we can provide them with the tools so that they can monitor this blood glucose. Not only do they recognize the signs and the symptoms, the fatigue, the mental uh, confusion, and so on and so forth, but they also are provided with tools like glucometers so that they have the ability to monitor these things at home. Now, I can hear what you're saying already. Well, we're in the Pacific. We can't afford to give everybody glucometers at home, okay? One of the things that many of you know about me is that I don't believe in this attitude of, well, we're just the Pacific. We can't do what's being done on the mainland. I believe that we have the ability to do everything that's being done on the mainland, and in many ways we can do it better because we have such a strong cultural and a social tie to our communities and the people around us. And so one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit later in the lecture is this idea of can we provide glucometers to individuals living in villages? 
all right, living outside of the mainstream populated areas that we have here in the Pacific. And just, you know, a spoiler alert, obviously I believe it can be done because we need, if we're going to help control the diabetes in the populations that we have, we need to give them the tools that they can monitor their, their uh, hyperglycemia, okay? Now we know that lifestyle choices, in particular diet and exercise, as well as uh, medications, which are oftentimes necessary in uh, terms of our diabetic patients, they can work in combination to help us control the hyperglycemia. But once again, from a public health and a health education standpoint, that's only going to be if we give people the education that they need and we give the people the tools that they need so that they can monitor uh, their hyperglycemia and they can actually get positive reinforcement and they can see that the lifestyle choices that they're making are actually having a, a, a recognizable impact on their hyperglycemia so that they can see, hey, look, when I control my diet, when I don't eat... Um you know, the sugar buns or the Lolo buns or whatever it is, when I get a couple of uh, good exercise times in across the day that I actually see that my, my blood glucose level is lowered. So we get a positive feedback to these individuals. But once again, it's only positive feedback if we can educate them and give them the tools that they need so that they can get that positive reinforcement. So, of course, what are some of the symptoms of diabetes? And you know these already, but we'll go through them anyway. We have the classic uh, couple of ones here. We have excess thirst. We have frequent urination. We have weight loss. We have the blurred vision. We have fatigue. And sometimes it's important to remember that there actually are no symptoms of type 2 diabetes. This isn't, in, in many ways, it's, it's like hypertension, which we call a silent killer. Most people don't know they have hypertension until there's some type of an incident associated with the hypertension, all right, such as a transient ischemic attack or something like that. And in many ways, it's going to be the same thing with the type 2 diabetes. Um, there may be the excessive thirst and the frequent urination and the weight loss and so on and so forth, or Maybe there won't be symptomologies associated with it until it gets so serious that the patient has uh, negative consequences, such as um, you know diabetic ulcers on the feet, whatever it happens to be. Okay, but really quick, um, the majority of our patients are going to have some type of symptomologies. But the problem is, by the time they have symptomologies and they actually present to their primary care clinician, that means that the diabetes is fairly well progressed. That you know we're past the stage of insulin resistance here. We've got full blown type two diabetes, and so of course it's non reversible at that point. All right, so we want people to understand. Um, not just the symptoms of diabetes, but we want them to understand where diabetes comes from in terms of their uh, poor lifestyle decisions so that we can prevent it before we get these actual symptomologies. And if you look at this, in particular the blurred vision and the fatigue, well what are these associated with? They're associated with that hyperglycemia that we talked about. They're associated with the inability of the insulin to convert uh, glucose into food at the cellular level. Okay. I love this. Um, I've got a couple of these um, uh, health education posters here. And the reason I chose them is because they were developed here in the Pacific. All right. Once again, showing that, hey, we're, we're aware of these things and we're actually doing things in terms of health education out here in the Pacific. So speaking of the Pacific, let's talk just a little bit more about the epidemiology of diabetes here in the Pacific region. So as of 2012, the International Diabetes Foundation, it went ahead and it ranked the countries worldwide in terms of their uh, public health burden, all right, in terms of type 2 diabetes. And what they found was that as of 2012, the federated states of Micronesia, uh, Pompeii, uh, Chuuk and Yap and Koshrai, okay, have the highest percentage of, of the population with type 2 diabetes in the world, all right, so that's 37.2 percent prevalence there, okay. So if we take a population of 35,000 people here in the FSM, what that means is that one in every three individuals is a type 2 diabetic, okay, and what do I have there? I said, why? You know, we ask the question, what has happened, all right, in terms of the Pacific? And one of the things I want to bring out, and I know I've mentioned this in lectures before, but I want to mention it in case you haven't uh, had the opportunity to meet me in person and, and to hear some of my lectures before, is that I am from Idaho originally, uh, but I've spent my entire professional career on islands. And I originally started out in the Caribbean and Latin America, and then I had the opportunity to come out here to the Pacific. And in many ways, I consider myself 
myself a Pacific Islander as well. All right, I can't help this color of my skin, but this is my home. Um, this is where I'm raising my family. This is where both my wife and I work. And so it makes me sad because one of the things that I know and I love about the Pacific is that I know we have a strong cultural history. We were warriors, all right? We were the ones that were, um, you know, migrating by the ocean currents and by the stars when, when my ancestors were still landlocked in Europe. So we have this strong tradition of being uh, a warrior people, uh, a global traversing people, a trading people. And so it makes me sad when I look at um, what's happened here in the Pacific. I look at a place like the Federated States of Micronesia that has such a strong cultural tradition, and I see that one in... Um, one in every three individuals here in Pompeii and across the FSM is going to be diabetic, and that's sad to me. All right, it's sad to me because we're going to see a situation where uh, we've come a long ways in terms of improving life expectation worldwide, including here in the Pacific. And what we're going to see is in the next two subsequent generations is we're going to see that those individuals are actually going to see reverses in the uh, uh, expected life expectancy gains. And they're actually going to start to go back to living the same amount of time as previous generations if we don't find a way to deal with the obesity and the diabetes and the cancer, and in particular, the obesity because the obesity is right at the center of the NCD epidemic or pandemic, we really could say, uh, worldwide. All right, um, you see that Nauru has um, is number two in the world, 30.1% prevalence, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, number three there with 27.1% prevalence. So once again, these are th these are ranked globally. This isn't just ranked here in the Pacific. This is an international ranking, and here we see that the top three nations in the world for type 2 diabetes prevalence are found right here in the northern Pacific. And of course, number four is uh, Cure Boss there. So what are the risk factors associated with um, central obesity? Okay, because obesity really is going to be the epicenter of the NCD pandemic, all right? And that's going to be the epicenter of the diabetes uh, pandemic as well, okay? Because obesity really is commonly associated with many different chronic health problems, including type 2 diabetes. It's also going to be associated with high levels of triglycerides, uh, clearly associated with low um, HDL. HDL is going to be the good cholesterol, so it's going to be associated with low levels of HDL and it's going to be associated with high levels of LDL. Okay, It's also going to be associated with hypertension. One of the things that we know about hypertension is that if we take a person who is obese, for example, and we can get them to lose even 10% of their uh, body mass, okay, that actually will decrease their systolic blood pressure by up to five points. And when we decrease the systolic blood pressure, what do we do? We decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, and in, uh, in particular, we decrease the risk of um, strokes and transient ischemic attacks and things like that, okay? All of that is associated with obesity. If we get the obesity levels down, we get the risk of type 2 diabetes down. We get the risk of cardiovascular disease down, okay? So really what it comes back around to is when we're dealing with NCDs, right you know, right at the center of the pandemic, if you, if you want to call it the uh, ground zero of the NCD pandemic, is always going to be obesity, okay? And once again, here I'll a little plug for myself. Again, if you go to my YouTube channel, there are currently two lectures up that deal with obesity. Actually, there's three, all right. There's the one that deals with global economic and nutritional shifting, talks about obesity in there. But in particular, there's two others. There's one, there's one that deals with childhood obesity prevention strategies, and there's another one that deals with obesity prevention strategies using the healthy communities approach, which looks at how can we work directly with communities to develop economic resilience and uh, physical resilience and um, social resilience uh, to the obesity pandemic that's sweeping across the Pacific here. So I do encourage you, if you have a chance, to go out and watch those lectures as well. And remember, for every lecture you watch, if you'll get in touch with me via email, I'll send you a certificate of professional development that you can use um, for nursing credits, uh, for uh, re renewing your license as a physician, an audiologist, whatever it happens to be. So like I said, if we can control obesity, we can control NCDs. Obesity really is the uh, epicenter here. 
Okay, so let's talk about uh, diabetes mortality, or in other words, diabetes causes uh, death here. And it's important to keep in mind that most of your diabetics aren't going to actually die from diabetes. They're going to die from the heart disease that's associated with their lifestyle choices, which has led them to diabetes as well as cardiovascular disease and risk for stroke, diabetic retinopathy, and so on and so forth. So you can see just a couple of stats there. Um, our diabetics are two to four times more likely to have heart disease. Um, so heart disease would be like um, peripheral artery disease, that'd be um, uh, strokes, myocardial infarcts, and so on and so forth. Um, they're two to four times more likely to have a stroke, two to eight times more likely to have heart failure, all right? And approximately 70% of all of our diabetes-related deaths are going to be associated with some form of vascular disease, okay? Like I said, PAD, stroke, heart attack, and so on and so forth. So our diabetes have a direct connection to increased mortality, but it's a direct connection to increased mortality from uh, cardiovascular causes primarily. So what else do we need to know in terms of morbidity? Well, um, our diabetics are at increase for amputations. We take away somebody's foot, their leg, their hand, whatever it happens to be. What else do we take away? Well, a lot of times we take away their livelihood. We take away their ability to function in society and to uh, take care of their families, Okay, which is a very negative thing because many people in the Pacific Islands are farmers, they're dairymen, um, they work with their hands, they're physically active, and they need the ability to be uh, functional and whole for them to take care of their families. So when we look at a place like Fiji, which is where I traditionally call home, and we see that at Colonial War Memorial Hospital, which is the major tertiary referral hospital for all of Fiji, when we see that we're doing an amputation once every 12 hours, and that the majority, you know, I would say 99.9% .9 of those amputations are directly associated with diabetes, then that's, that's scary. Because here we have something that is entirely preventable, but yet we're not doing anything about it. We're not finding ways to directly connect with the populations who are at risk. What else do we see? Well, we see diabetic retinopathy and we see blindness. Okay, same thing again. If I take somebody and I suddenly take away their eyesight, this is going to be very costly to them socially as well as economically because they can't take care of themselves at that point. And of course, the other thing with both the amputations and the diabetic retinopathy and so on and so forth is that it's very costly because suddenly, how do we support this individual in our societies when we don't have real strong economic basis uh, bases uh, out here in the Pacific? And then the other thing to keep in mind is that we don't have the rehabilitation uh, tools that most other uh, highly developed areas of the world have. So we don't have physiatrists. We don't oft always have um, physiat excuse me, physiatrists, which are a type of physician that specializes in rehabilitation. We don't always have occupational therapists and speech language pathologists and so on and so forth. And then, of course, the other thing that we don't oftentimes have is we don't have the people available to make prosthetic limbs. In a recent study I participated with, and I know I've mentioned this in some of my other presentations before, we looked at NCD-related disability in the region, and what we saw is that the population of individuals who make the prosthetic limbs are old, and they're getting ready to retire. And it's really an artisan type of thing that if you want to learn how to do that here in the Pacific, you you go and you learn from one of these men and women who are essentially masters in making these prosthetic limbs. Well, there isn't much interest in this next generation in doing that, and so as that older group of individuals that have been making our prosthetic limbs for the past 30 plus years die out and retire, who will take their place and who will provide these prosthetic limbs? Of course, we have to consider renal failure and dialysis, which is extremely expensive. When we look at the uh, percentage of income that a country spends on medical services, we tend to see that a very high percentage of that goes to dialysis. Once again, not every individual... Um, who is undergoing dialysis or has renal failure, not every one of those individuals could have been prevented in, but a large percentage could have. And of course, not every one of our Pacific Islands is going to have access to dialysis. And so what do we do? Do we pay to fly individuals to neighboring islands? so that they can secure their dialysis. And of course, in terms of renal failure, nowhere in the Pacific do we do uh, transplants. 
And of course, like we were just talking about in the previous slide, our diabetics have increased risk of stroke. That comes along with mental impairments. Um, once again, we don't have a lot of rehab available for that. And when we have these individuals who have had a stroke and um, possibly need to be in a wheelchair or possibly need to be in a nursing facility, that's expensive and it takes away a loss of livelihood from those individuals. So really what this all comes down to is that there's a high social cost. There's a high cost to the family and the community by um, having an impaired individual or an individual who dies, and, and that comes along with economic cost as well, all right? And then there's going to be the social cost to families that need to care for the disabled individuals. We're very lucky here in the Pacific. Once again, I go back to that idea of um, we have a strong culture, we have a strong social basis, and so oftentimes we can come together as a community and as a village to take care of these individuals, but we know that even, even when we have that social obligation built into us through culture, we still know that it is very costly in terms of families for both economic reasons as well as um, psychosocial reasons when they have to take care of an individual who has lost their ability to take care of themselves. All right, so let's talk about how can patients prevent the complications of diabetes, because we're already going with the assumption, as we've shown on one of the other slides, that the uh, top four countries in the world for um, the burden of type 2 diabetes are found right here in the Pacific. So we have a large number of individuals. So in other words, we need to talk about how can we control the uh, complications so that we don't end up with these high economic and social costs or amputations, diabetic retinopathy, and so on and so forth. Well, the uh, primary one is we need regular checkups with our health care provider. So we ask ourselves the questions, and I'm not going to answer these. I want you to think about um, how these apply in your particular jurisdiction, wherever you happen to be practicing here in the Pacific. How can we go about integrating primary preventative care into the culture of the Pacific? How do we convince individuals? Because while we are... Uh, similar in many ways, our cultures do differ depending upon the particular um, um, islands that we're talking about. And so in a lot of areas, uh, a lot of cultures in the Pacific, we don't necessarily uh, go to the doctor on a routine basis, certainly not for a uh, screening basis, all right? Uh, we tend to turn to family and friends when we have health concerns. We tend to turn to uh, traditional healers, uh, you know, whether it be bush medicine, whatever we happen to do, okay? And so we need to find a way that we can actually integrate this idea of prevention and going to your doctor, not just when you're sick, but going to your doctor when you're healthy to prevent the onset of illness into the culture of the Pacific. And like I said, it's up to you to think about how that's applicable in your jurisdiction. And of course, we have this issue of too few providers, all right? Um, here in Pompeii, where I'm currently working, uh, we're reaching the end of the lifespan of the medical officers that were trained here in the 1990s. And we don't have a lot of people from Federated States of Micronesia that are going to places like the Fiji School of Medicine to become physicians, all right? So physicians, we're, we're starting to run out of those, all right? We're trying to integrate in new providers, such as uh, nurse, nurse practitioners in a, a program, for example, that's being developed in the Marshall Islands with Fiji National University and the uh, Community College over there. But once again, you know, how is it that we can get more providers? In particular, how is it we can get local providers that are part of the culture here, that understand the culture of the Pacific, so that we're not necessarily relying heavily on expat providers anymore as well? And we do occasionally have these little crises. So like right now in uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, in particular Pompeii State, we have a health assistance that uh, function essentially as mid-level providers in many of our outlying islands. Well, same thing again. The health assistants are reaching the end of their careers. They're getting ready to retire. And so we're asking ourselves the question, how do we train the next generation of health assistants to provide care here in Pompeii? And in particular, can we train them not only to provide clinical or biomedical care, but can we train them also to provide preventative care? All right, can we train them in the principles of good medicine, but also in the principles of good prevention? 
preventative medicine and public health as well. Okay, And then the other thing that we need to think about is we really do have a lack of health literacy in the populations here in the Pacific. Now once again, like I said, when I, when I point out the shortfalls of the Pacific, please understand that I'm part of the Pacific and I'm part of the educational and uh, public health infrastructure of the Pacific. So if there's a problem, it's my problem too. Okay, But we do, when I talk about health literacy, remember what I'm talking about here is do people understand what causes a disease, okay? And do people understand the importance of preventing the disease? Now, we are increasing the health literacy of our populations, little by little, generation by generation. But to a great extent, we still have a lack of health literacy. So, for example, in some of the Pacific Island jurisdictions where I have worked, people assume that diabetes, which they oftentimes will call sugar, you know, I have the sugar, or she has the sugar, they assume that Diabetes is simply an offshoot of the natural process of aging. That as you get older, you get type 2 diabetes. They don't understand that it's something that can be prevented. And I want to point out that this idea that type 2 diabetes is simply part of the aging process, it's not unique to the Pacific. I've seen it in the Caribbean. I've seen it in Latin America as well. But that's something that our public health agencies can work on beginning with school-age children. It's important that we educate, educate people at a very young age. Okay, now here's the one I mentioned uh, briefly towards the beginning of the lecture. Home blood sugar testing is very, very successful in terms of keeping blood sugar levels close to normal. All right, We can teach people to recognize uh, mental confusion, slowness, and so on and so forth as the side effects of um, hypoglycemia, or, or excuse me, hyperglycemia. But it's important that we, and we can do that with their family and their friends as well. But really, in terms of giving people a... Uh, uh, a quantitative tool, the home glucose uh, testing strips and the home glucose monitors are actually very, very, very effective. And like I was mentioning before, if we can develop a positive feedback system for people where they can see that their diet changes and their exercise changes um, are actually having a direct effect on their blood glucose levels, then people become much more motivated. And we have some really good studies to show this, that people become motivated, all right? And in this way, they, they take ownership. And listen to this. This is important. They take ownership of their health. And when they take ownership of their health, they decide to make decisions to improve their health. It no longer becomes a situation of, well, I go to the doctor, the doctor checks my blood sugar, and the doctor tells me what to do. No. When we provide home blood sugar testing, these people take ownership of their own health issues, and they begin to track things themselves. Now, obviously, it's not just as simple as, you know, passing out a thousand blood sugar uh, glucometers, okay? It's important that we develop programs that work closely with community organizations such as churches or if you have a diabetes foundation or you have um, a cultural organization such as a Filipino society that you work with those organizations to target the individuals within their membership who are diabetics and you provide a training program to these individuals so that once again they understand the importance of monitoring and they understand what the tool is used for, okay? And then, of course, the other thing that we do in providing that type of um, systems-based approach and monitoring approach where they can take ownership is we want to provide that training to their family and their friends so that their family and friends can become coaches for them, can become um, cheerleaders for these individuals. Because one of the things that I've seen, and not just here in the Pacific, I've seen it a lot of other places that I've worked, is that other members of the family are kind of funny about it. They're like, oh, come on, Grandma, just have another piece of cake. It's, it's uh, your grandson's birthday. Day. Or, if, or if you have a piece of cake today, you know, you could just be extra better tomorrow. Well, we want people to become uh, a team in their home, in their village, in their community, in their church, whatever it happens to be, so that they can reinforce good behavior with these individuals. And then that reinforced good behavior is exhibited in a tangible result from that glucometer. All right. Now, there are, um, once again, it's, it's up to you to figure out how you can best implement this, but there are organizations such as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, even Johns Hopkins Hospital, um, USAID, AusAid, China Aid, whoever it happens to be 
There are organizations out there that you can approach with a good targeted plan to provide glucose monitoring to individuals in the community. And oftentimes you can approach manufacturers and if you want to buy a bulk package of these glucometers, you can get a significant discount on them as well. Now, what is the long-term sustainability of this? Well, you've got to figure out a way to provide the monitoring strips, and you've got to find a way to get these individuals integrated into a uh, community primary care setting, whether it be a community health center, whether it be a health assistant, or a nursing post, whatever it happens to be, so that they have some place to turn to when their blood glucose monitoring gets out of whack. All right, so that they have some type of expert opinion and advice that they can turn to when they reach the point where they actually need medical assistance. All right, so how can patients prevent the complications of diabetes? Well, they can keep their blood pressure and their cholesterol normal. Once again, we need to work on those low health literacy levels with individuals. And then we need to provide public access to screening of blood pressure and screening of cholesterol so that we can educate people. Okay. Easier said than done though, right? Because it becomes very difficult sometimes to uh, educate people. But once again, I'm a firm believer in working with community-based organizations, in particular churches, cultural, um, ethnic organizations, and so on and so forth. Because when you get involved with those organizations, then oftentimes there's some type of a leader in that organization that people in the community will listen to. So I have an example of this. Um, when I worked as associate dean of a medical school in Aruba, we would do community health fairs where we would screen individuals for hypertension, BMI, uh, blood sugar levels, so on and so forth. And we found that the most successful way of going out and screening a population was that we would work with the Catholic Church. Because we knew that if the priests on the island got up on Sunday, got up at Mass during the week or wherever it happened to be, and they said to their parishioners, they said, um, the medical school is coming and they're going to hold a health fair with us this Saturday afternoon. And I believe that uh, part of your religious duty is that you need to stay healthy so that you can be a good servant to uh, your family and so on and so forth, then all of a sudden people perked up and they paid attention and they listened. And when we worked with the church, we had huge turnout in terms of the populations that came out to be screened. All right, So look for innovative way to work with community organizations. And of course, lifestyle interventions are going to be very, very important. How can we convince people to uh, become involved in weight loss, regular exercise, monitoring their own diet, and so on and so forth? For more information on this, and in particular what I call the Healthy Communities Approach, please go to my YouTube site and find that lecture that deals with uh, obesity prevention using the Healthy Communities Approach. Okay, It uh, goes much more in depth into how we can uh, do lifestyle interventions based around obesity prevention and control. And of course, what we're up against is we're up against what I'm calling the new culture of the Pacific in regards to lifestyle. And tragically, what this has resulted in is that we're one of the sickest regions in the world. Okay, and But once again, this goes back to look at the picture I have off to the left here. All right, How is it that we can return to our strong culture of the past when we were um, warriors, when we used subsistence farming, when we were physically active, and so on and so forth? Okay. You don't have to uh, go back to living in the village. You don't have to go back to being a hunter-gatherer for you to embrace your past cultural heritage. Uh, I worked on a program on a tiny little island in the Caribbean called Nevis, and uh, that's exactly what we did there, is we worked with the populations, because what had happened on Nevis was it went from being a very poor island to having suddenly an explosion of tourism, that brought in economic opportunities and it had a sudden explosion of the offshore banking industry that brought in economic opportunities. But with those economic opportunities came sedentary lifestyles, all right, and reliance on uh, prepackaged foods, processed carbohydrates, fats, so on and so forth, the traditional thing that we've also seen happen here in the Pacific. But what we did was we worked with people and we said, you might, you know, we, we helped them convince we helped convince them to reconnect with their past so that they understood just because I'm sitting in an office all day doesn't mean that I can't reconnect with the strong, physical, uh, active lifestyle that my ancestors had. And it was actually very, very successful. That's something that was done on a tiny little island, a tiny of, island of only about 10,000 people that literally took, was 20 miles around the island from one side to the other. So if it can work on a tiny island in the Caribbean, it certainly is something we can do here in the Pacific. So we can return to a strong culture of our healthy past. 
So how can we keep blood sugars level? Well, you know most of this already, all right? But we'll go through it anyway. Really, it's the same management strategies that we pre uh, that we would talk about in terms of preventing type 2 diabetes uh, are also going to help us keep our blood sugar levels normal in our patients who are either pre-diabetic, you know, insulin resistant, or full-blown type 2 diabetes. And once again, it's going to be diet and exercise. It's going to be weight loss in those who are overweight. And of course, medications sometimes are going to be necessary, but medications should always Always be taken in concert with lifestyle modifications as well. And here's, I'll just give you another example of how we can use culture in order to do these things. I worked with um, with an organization at Idaho State University called the Hispanic Health Project, and what it did was it worked with migrant uh, farm workers who had come up from Mexico to work in our potato harvest, and um, they had some of the highest rates of type 2 diabetes in the population there in southeastern Idaho. And so what we did was we found that, well, if we just went out and told people to do aerobic exercise and be physically fit, that was not very popular. So what we did was we worked with members of the community and we developed what was called salsa aerobics, because we knew that the population that we had were very uh, enjoyed things like salsa dancing. In particular, the women enjoyed the salsa dancing, and these were women. It tended to be the women that had the highest rates of type 2 diabetes and obesity. And what we did was we turned salsa dancing into aerobics. And so people came out and they danced and they had a wonderful time, and it was culturally appropriate for them. But at the same time, they were getting exercise. And in the cohort that we were following, what we found was that those that were participating in a fun activity of salsa aerobics were also the ones that were better able to manage their, um, uh, their uh, blood glucose levels. All right, lifestyle changes, of course, are going to be a significant one, in particular nutrition therapy. So we want people to decrease fat content as well as their total caloric intake. But we also have to recognize that sometimes the economic realities of people, uh, of the way people are living, is that they can't always go to a diet high in um, fruits and vegetables because they can't afford to go to the store and purchase these things. Well, there are things that we can do about that as well. We can do a multi-sectoral approach to what is really a public health problem and we can get um, we can get the economic sector involved, we can get the agricultural sector involved, and so on and so forth, so that we can develop home gardening for people, subsistence gardening, square foot gardening, um, or maybe we can actually work with people so that their garden becomes a roadside food stall where they sell Chinese uh, cabbage and they sell cucumbers and tomatoes and, and carrots and all the wonderful things that grow really, really easily here in the Pacific. And so all of a sudden, not only does the community have access to uh, better sources of food at reasonable prices because we're not importing apples from Washington State and potatoes from Idaho. We're producing things locally, so economically it's easier for people to get access to it. Okay, And economically, suddenly we provided economic benefit to the family that is selling these things. All right, So you've got to look at not just this idea, well, we, we tell people to eat less and we tell people to move more, but we have to ask ourselves, how do we go about providing economic opportunities that... Um, that allow people to make better nutritional choices. And once again, go out and watch some of those other lectures I did. I talk about that quite a bit. And of course, some other lifestyle changes. We want to increase um, exercise. We want people, like I just mentioned uh, a second ago, we want them to eat less and move for. And in particular, we want to focus on um, children. All right, I'm not saying we should ignore the adults, but if we can prevent a child from becoming obese, at a young age, we have prevented a child from being a diabetic. We prevented a child from being at risk of cancer, heart disease, and so on and so forth. Okay. Conversely, an obese child almost always becomes an obese adult. The, the cards are stacked against a child who becomes obese early on. They will be an obese adult, whereas if we prevent obesity in the children, then we prevent obesity a lot of times in adulthood. Okay. So we, um, when we increase our exercise, it really is a true biggest bang for your buck approach because suddenly we've decreased the obesity problem, and when we decrease the obesity problem, we decrease all the other NCD problems as well. Um, 
and like I said, there's there's the video that deals with childhood obesity that I'd like you to go watch. But just a few things I'll mention from that video right now is, do we require physical education in the schools? How much physical education is required in the schools? Do we provide places within the physical environment of the islands that we live in where people can safely go engage in physical activity? Um, here in Pompeii, as I drive around doing my little windshield surveys, I find that if there is an empty lot, people are being physically active. Active, and in particular kids. In the uh, building where I now live, um, they just paved a dirt lot next door. Uh, it's essentially a parking lot, but it's not really being used as that. But within a day of that dirt lot being paved, suddenly people were playing basketball in it. Kids were over there riding bicycles. So if we provide opportunities uh, for people to be physically active, then they will become physically active. It almost, especially when we're dealing with children. But once again, we've got to look at what is the local environment and what are the policies that are in place that encourage physical activity. And of course, smoking is a big deal as well. Smoking cessation really does reduce the morbidity and mortality that's associated with uh, type 2 diabetes, as well as risk factors for other diseases, in particular heart disease. Okay. Um, Smoking is an increasing problem in the USAPI. So when I say USAPI, I mean the United States uh, affiliated Pacific Islands. So that would be uh, that would be like RMI, uh, FSM, Palau, and so on and so forth. And it does appear that smoking is increasing in these jurisdictions. Okay, um, we mentioned self monitoring of blue, uh, blood glucose already, especially those home glucometers. And I also mentioned this idea of training and self management, recognizing when you can deal with your glucose problem at home versus when you need to seek actual medical intervention as well. So those are some additional changes that we can do there with our populations. And of course, there's tons of benefits associated with exercise. It's going to decrease insulin resistance, which is in turn going to lower our blood sugar, which in turn is going to lower those side effects that we talked about previous. It's going to improve our weight, our blood pressure. Um, it's going to decrease our LDL cholesterol, and it's going to increase our HDL cholesterol. It's also going to uh, decrease our triglycerides, which are really a, really a, a better measure of your risk of cardiovascular disease than um, LDL and HDL and even total cholesterol, okay? In some patients, it might actually increase the risk of blood sugar, all right? So we want to make sure that uh, increase the risk of um, hyperglycemia in patients who are on insulin, all right? So in other words, we want to make sure that um, patients that are at risk, we should pre-screen these individuals for coronary artery disease and make sure that they understand the risks and also the warning signs so that they can seek medical, uh, medical assistance as necessary. So what are the benefits of modest weight loss? Well, first of all, it's important in the populations that you serve, whether you're a clinician, a health educator, a public health planner, whatever it happens to be, it's important that you help the populations you serve understand that even small amounts of weight loss can have big benefits in terms of health, all right? So I mentioned earlier, even, a, even losing 10% of your body weight, you know, so if you've got an individual that's 240 pounds and they lose 24 pounds over the course of, uh, say, six months to nine months to a year, that that's going to have significant benefits in areas such as their systolic blood pressure going down and hence their risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease. So even modest weight loss can reduce our risk of cardiovascular disease. It can lower our blood sugar levels, which decreases uh, for, uh, for patients who are pre-diabetic. That's going to reduce the risk of them going over to full-blown diabetes. For patients who have type 2 diabetes already, that's going to result in better um, better control of the symptoms of the diabetes and a healthier lifestyle for those individuals. Like I mentioned already, it's going to decrease their blood pressure. It's going to de decrease the bad cholesterol, the uh, low-density lipoproteins, and it's going to increase the high-density lipoproteins, the good cholesterol. Now remember what happens with um, cholesterol. Cholesterol is not fat. Remember, cholesterol is a form of sterols. It's a, a waxy material that, in, in theory, um, builds up in the uh, arteries, all right? Um, and the idea is that the LDL is the one that's going to build up, but actually the HDL, which can be found in good oils like olive oil and, and nuts and so on and so forth, can actually come along and work like a little bulldozer to remove the LDL. So modest weight loss, changes in um, exercise levels and changes in what we're eating can actually increase our HDL. 
All right. For a lot of our obese patients, sleep apnea is a real problem, and with sleep apnea comes the risk of sudden cardio cardiac death. All right. And here in the Pacific, in most of our jurisdictions, we don't have sleep medicine specialists, and we don't have CPAP and things like that. All right. So if we decrease our weight, we're going to decrease the risk of sleep apnea, snoring, uh, risk of uh, sudden cardiac death uh, during sleep as well. And it actually decreases the symptoms of degenerative joint disease that are associated with having high amounts of weight to, to pack around on our knees and on our back and so on and so forth. So like I said, the, the real take-home message here is that even modest weight loss can result in some pretty significant benefits to the patient populations that you are serving. All right, so how can blood sugar levels be kept to normal? I did mention um, lifestyle is a big thing, but we have to acknowledge that medication is going to be required as well, okay? But of course, like I said, um, we shouldn't ever be in a situation where our patients simply rely on the medication. We always want to encourage them to not only use, uh, you know, the glucophage, the metformin, but we want them to use that in concert with diet and exercise alterations as well, okay? So like I said, insulin might be necessary in patients whose bone bodies are not producing enough insulin. And a lot of times people are going to require long-term medication management. But like I said, it's important that they do that in consultation uh, or in concert, excuse me, with some of the lifestyle modifications as well, which once again, this is so important uh, that we integrate our public health services into our primary care services so that we have that dual approach that says not only are we going to approach you from a biomedical standpoint, we're going to put you on metformin, uh, maybe we're going to put you on some aspirin to reduce your cardiovascular risk and so on and so forth, but at the same time we're going to have you work with our dietitians and our health educators so that you can understand the benefits of weight loss and altering your lifestyle, so that you can understand how to use the glucometer that we want to give you to take home, so that your adult daughter who helps take care of you can understand the purpose of the glucometer and the purpose of the diabetes education and making sure that you take your metformin and so on and so forth. So I'll just mention really quick here in Pompeii, we have um, community health centers that are uh, federally funded, and we have a number of them. Uh, but we're very fortunate that we received grant funding to develop a new community health center that's going to be co-located on the campus of the College of Micronesia FSM. And uh, what's really neat about that is it's going to be co-located right next to the nursing and the public health training programs. And not only are we going to provide medical, uh, dental, nursing, so on and so forth, but we're going to integrate the public health model of prevention and also health education right into that community health center. And it's going to have a dedicated floor space on the second floor where we can bring the community in and we can do health education, where we can work directly with the community in developing interventions that will be appropriate for them. See, so exciting things can be done in very resource-limited environments like the Federated States of Micronesia to integrate primary care alongside preventative health care and to target these populations that are at risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes. So in our diabetics, all right, and once again, this is this is appropriate to you whether you're a nurse, a public health planner, whatever it happens to be, we also want to treat hypertension in our, diab our diabetics. And that's because of associated risk factors. Our diabetics oftentimes are hypertensive, and with that hypertension comes a risk of cardiovascular uh, disease. And like I said, just keep in mind that most of your diabetics actually aren't going to die from the diabetes. They're going to die from heart disease, all right, from a stroke, from a myocardial infarction for whatever it happens to be. So in our, high, our hypertensive diabetics, our goal is that we get a blood pressure um, around 130 or less than 130 over 80, right? So notice we're not shooting for the ideal of 120 over 80, but we are shooting for a systolic blood pressure of at least 130 or below, okay? Now, because we're shooting for that and because we're also talking about lifestyle factors, we also have to consider that these individuals oftentimes are going to need blood pressure medications as well. And these can be things like ACE inhibitors and so on and so forth. Um, in concert with diuretics, for example, for our early stage hypertensive patients as well, all right? Um, but the point is we want to approach the hypertension the same way that we're approaching the diabetes. We want to approach it from both a lifestyle approach as well as the specific biomedical approach. And so like I said, you might want to do a multi-drug approach with these individuals, such as an ACE inhibitor as well as a diuretic, especially for those who have stage 2 hypertension. 
All right, so we also want to have um, cholesterol treatments as well for these individuals. Like I said, we want to see uh, relatively low triglycerides, but in particular, we want to uh, see changes in terms of both their HDL and their LDL as far as their total cholesterol goals go. So we want to see their LDL of less than 100, we want to see triglycerides less than 150, and we want to see our um, high-density lipoproteins, or HDL, remember those are the good cholesterols that can uh, remove the bad cholesterol, we want to see that greater than 50. And same thing again with the treatment. Initially, of course, we want to look at lifestyle modification because lifestyle modification can lower cholesterol in most patients, not all patients, but in most. So we want to look at uh, weight loss, moderation of um, saturated fats, um, decrease or excessive use of carbohydrates. So in other words, you know, that goes back to basic health education. Are you having both? How many different sources of starches do you have in a single meal? Do you have rice and dalo and cassava and uh, flatbreads in the same meal? Or can you go back to having fewer carbohydrates and increase the number of vegetables and good proteins such as tuna that you have in a single meal? And of course, we might have to do medication management such as the statin drugs in order for us to reach an ideal goal. We also might want to consider aspirin therapy in these patients. Um, aspirin therapy has actually been shown to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by 10, uh, 10 to 20% in patients with diabetes. So that is a significant uh, decrease there. Now I want to mention that with all of these biomedical approaches I'm talking about, the statins, the uh, glucophage, the aspirin therapy, these of course require a licensed medical practitioner. This isn't something that you would uh, just tell the general population to go and start taking aspirin. We want these individuals to be screened in a primary care setting by a physician, a physician assistant, health assistant, whatever it happens to be, so that we can appropriately prescribe different types of therapies. Now, it can be something as simple as baby aspirin, 81 milligrams, has actually been shown to have the benefits of an adult size um, aspirin or a 325 milligram pill in these individuals. And it's recommended in uh, patients with diabetes who are over age 30 and who have another uh, heart risk factor such as, um, uh, you know, known cardiovascular disease, obesity, hypertension, whatever it happens to be at that point. So aspirin therapy is certainly something that's relatively inexpensive, but it can have relatively high payoff. So for those of you working strictly in public health, that's certainly something you might want to talk about with your public health medical director. All right, so let's go over what we talked about here really quick. So we know diabetes is common um, here in the Pacific. Uh, it's one of the more common types of non-communicable diseases that we deal with. Okay. We know that control of blood sugar levels and blood pressure and cholesterol can actually really reduce the risk of developing the complications of diabetes. All right, and we know that patient education about healthy lifestyle choices and diabetes management is going to be an important feature of good diabetes control. And once again, I just want to put in my plug once again that the, the, the home glucose monitoring is something that can be done here in the Pacific. All right, it just takes some effort on the part of the medical infrastructure and the public health infrastructure to educate the populations in, in whom. Uh, would be receiving the glucometer, all right, so that they understand what it's for, what it's there for, how to use it, and how to respond appropriately uh, to what it tells them. And of course, like I mentioned before, it can be a very positive tool for positive reinforcement because the individuals can see that the lifestyle modifications that they're making have had a positive uh, impact on their glucose levels. So this re leaves us what I call the big question, all right? And this goes back to what I was talking about uh, towards the beginning. We are a, a region of the world that has a history dating back several millennia, all right? We're a strong people. We're a brave people. We're a warrior people. We're a self-reliant people, all right? But we were, unfortunately, we're getting away from that because of economic and nutritional shifts that we're seeing in our populations. And so, unfortunately, we're becoming a very unhealthy region of the world. And in fact, we have the highest rates of diabetes and the highest rates of obesity of any region in the world. So the question becomes, how do we return to a healthier lifestyle of the past? How do we go back and re-embrace the traditions that made us a strong people that were able to navigate the largest ocean on the, in the world without GPS, without satellites, without um, 
you know, taking readings of the moon and the sun. We were doing it based upon the currents of the ocean. How do we get back to being that strong, healthy people? Well, it's up to you. You're the public health, you're the medical, you're the nursing, you're the allied health science practitioners of the Pacific that can do that because you can become the advocates for a healthy lifestyle and for a return to the strong well-being of the past.